Thank you guys for coming. You know, it's a beautiful day out there, this morning anyway, and so for you guys to be in here in the basement thinking about gardening when you could be out gardening, I really applaud you because you know what, it's a little bit early for a lot of our gardening even though it might feel like it would be this morning. So, but don't hold your breath because I'm afraid that by this afternoon it won't be anymore. So Midge had talked a little bit about, and Jason both talked about the Master Gardener program. I just want to talk a little bit about what the Master Gardener volunteer program is. It is a volunteer organization. Our goal and purpose in life is to help homeowners garden. So we are part of the OSU Extension. Our role is to free up the employees to work with nurseries and those kinds of people, you know, the professional people. And so we work with the home gardener. So we have a helpline, uh, we teach classes like this, we are available to do classes in other formats as well. We do garden clubs and you know, other organizations. Um, so if you, if you have a desire to be a master gardener, there is a sign-up sheet we can kind of keep you informed. We will have our next training round starts in February. And it's a pretty intensive kind of training, but you learn a lot and it's a lot of fun. The group is a great group. We've got a couple of the Master Gardeners in the room here today. So today we're going to talk about asparagus. So everybody loves asparagus, right? So this is my asparagus from the grocery store because it's a little early to have <laughs> asparagus so far. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about this stuff, right? So I'm assuming that if you're here, you probably really, really like asparagus. Right? And so you want to be able to grow it. So this is what we're going to talk about and focus on asparagus in the landscape. Um, and we'll talk about what these mean, what the plants need, how, to, how can you buy them, how can you plant them, how do you maintain them. And then we'll talk a little bit about harvesting. And we'll then also talk a little bit about pests and diseases and how to manage those specific to asparagus plants. And then I'll give you a couple hints for actually storing and using asparagus. And then, and then, of course, obviously, we have the opportunity for questions at the end. So let's just get started. Asparagus is not a typical vegetable from the perspective of how you grow it, right? So most of the vegetables that we grow in Northeast Ohio are what we call annuals, right? So we plant them in the spring and we pull them out in the fall. That's not true of asparagus. Asparagus is a perennial, right? So a perennial means I plant it once and it grows over a number of years. So just like a tree or a bush, it's gonna be in your landscape for a while. In fact, up to 20 years or so. It comes back every year. Asparagus plants survive for around 20 years. So when you decide where it goes, you need to think about it not just from the perspective of this is a plant that's going to be here for a year, but this is going to be here for 20 years. So utilize it as a landscape plant, not just your typical vegetable garden. It also, like many other perennial plants, takes a few years for it to get established before you can harvest it. So just like if you were to plant a fruit tree, that usually takes three to five years. This also takes several years, so, and we'll talk more about that later. So you need a dedicated space because you don't want to disturb the roots. So treat it like a landscape plant, all right, rather than an annual vegetable. So asparagus in the landscape. When it first, so first of all, at this time of year, you won't see asparagus in your landscape, right? So Diane, my friend Diane says she's got asparagus plants already. What do they look like right now? Soil. Soil. <laughs> they look like blank soil. So asparagus, although it is a perennial, it dies back to the ground every year. Okay? So when it first comes up out of the ground, it looks like this. Right? So that looks familiar to you, right? It looks like this. So that's what an asparagus when it first comes up, that's what it looks like. As it grows bigger, it looks like this. So all of these little, you're familiar with kind of like flowery stuff on the top. This isn't a flower. This is a branch. So this all opens up into this. 
right? So that's how asparagus grows. And it can look like this. So this is, if you, to give you a perspective, this pole in the back is 10 feet tall. Asparagus, depending upon your growing conditions, can be anywhere from three to four feet to eight to 10 feet, like this one was. And you'll notice that it gets pretty bushy and, you know, it, 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 it can ca create a screen almost, right? So this, is, this particular garden, it was actually on the, on the side behind it is a vegetable garden and it was kind of used as a, a fence to keep the deer out of the vegetable garden on that side. So some of the advantages, obviously it's delicious. We all like asparagus, right? That's why we're here, that's why we grow it. It's critter resistant, and I won't tell you that it's critter proof, but it is critter resistant. Um, and what I mean by that is that very few mammals will eat it. So deer don't bother it, rabbits don't really bother it, mice and chipmunks and voles and squirrels, they don't really bother asparagus, which is really great. There are some critters, smaller critters, that we'll talk about, the insects that will bother it, but for the most part, your bigger groundhogs and those kinds of things that we worry about don't really bother asparagus. It can create a visual border, as we already talked about, so don't plant things you want to see behind it in the summertime, right? So don't put it here, your house is there, and your pretty flowers there because you'll never see your flowers again because they're behind the asparagus, right? Because remember, that's a wall of eight foot tall, ferny looking things. It's beautiful. I love to put big leafed plants right in front of it. It's a great backdrop for that, right? So if you've got something like elephant ears or or okra or things like that that have large leaves, it looks great right up against your asparagus plants. So what does an asparagus plant need? Right? So every plant has its own needs. Right? Some need sun, more sunlight than others, some need more water than others, some need different soil types. So let's talk about what asparagus needs because like every other plant, it's unique. Right? So first thing is it needs full sun. Right? So if you don't have it in a place that's full sun, it won't get 8 to 10, 12, 12 feet tall. It'll be 3 to 4 feet tall. And one of the things about asparagus in most perennial plants is that that greenness that it happens in the, all summer long and it's feeding the plant, it's storing all of that energy that it created down in its roots. So if you don't have a lot of green, you don't get a lot of stored energy in the root system. And if you don't have a lot of stored energy in the root system, then the next year you don't get as much green growth, right? So it's a cycle. So we'll talk a little bit about how to, how to, to make that happen. But full sun is very important because it, it needs to, that, to do that photosynthesis and create that energy to put down into its roots. The soil needs to be very fertile, um, well composted, well fertilized if you use chemical fertilizer or compost if you're organic. Needs to be well drained and a soil pH of between five, six and a half to seven. Now seven is neutral, six and a half is slightly acidic which is actually ideal for this area. Most of us here in this area have a slightly acidic soil which is great. However, as my front yard can attest this morning, we don't necessarily have a great drainage system in this area. So oftentimes I recommend actually a raised bed or some, some you know, get the, get the asparagus up a little bit out of your, your standard soil so that you've got it, so that it drains, right? Because if it's too soggy, if those roots are too soggy, they will rot in the ground instead of produce asparagus for you. They also need to be undisturbed. Remember I said that the, the energy that it creates in the, the leaves goes to the, to the roots over the winter 
and then that's what creates the leaves again in the, summer, in the spring, right? If you disturb those roots a lot, then it loses that energy and power that, that it's produced. Space. Like many plants, if you plant things too close to it, then it gets, it gets uh, choked out, right? Again, it may not get as much sun. So the recommendation is, as you plant an asparagus plant, you want to plant them about 18 inches from each other, but about two to three feet from anything else, right? Because remember, you don't want to disturb the roots, you don't want a lot of competition, and then, you know, so the standard they tell you when you buy the plants is four to six feet tall. If you have really good, you might, soil in really good conditions, like this picture, you know, those were eight feet tall. So, in competition, you want to keep your asparagus bed just asparagus, right? You want to keep it weed free. You want to mulch it so that it keeps the moisture, it keeps the weeds down. Okay, so we've talked about asparagus in the landscape and what the plants need. Now we're gonna, we're gonna kind of shift gears and talk about how do we buy them, how do we plant them, and how do we maintain the asparagus plants. So purchasing asparagus. You can purchase asparagus in one of several ways. The first way is that you can buy seeds, right? So remember though I said that asparagus is a perennial that can take several years to get established. If you plant them as seeds, it'll take five years before you can, before it's strong enough for you to support harvesting. The other disadvantage of planting, well, there's actually two more. The second disadvantage is that not every seed will germinate, and so you plant a seed and you may or may not get a plant. And the third disadvantage is that asparagus actually has male and female plants. Okay, so female plants flower, male fl plants don't. Typically when you buy asparagus, you want them primarily male plants for two reasons. One is because if you have both male and female, you end up with lots of baby asparagus. And the second reason is because, remember that whole energy in the root system? If your plant is dedicated to producing seed, it doesn't have as much energy stored in its root system because it's create, using energy for that. So male plants are more productive and they will not produce a whole bunch of baby asparagus. So if you get a bunch of baby asparagus, then, I mean, that seems like it's a great thing, right? Because then you get more plants, but then you end up with your, your asparagus bed being overcrowded because you've got a lot of little ones in there. So the second way you can buy them is it's plants. So usually not at this time of year, but oftentimes sometime in the summer, the nurseries will have asparagus plants available and they'll look something like this and they can be planted in the same way that we're going to talk about planting them here in a minute. This works and you get a head start over seeds. However, usually they haven't had them in, the, in there long enough to be able to tell whether or not they're male and female. And they're also more expensive this way than the way that I recommend, and most, most people will recommend that you, you grow asparagus, and that is from crowns. So a crown is actually the root system, right? So as you look at this, this is the actual crown. This is where the, this, this section right up here at the top it is the part that's going to put up that, those spears out of the ground, right? And then this whole, all the rest of this is roots. So this is cheaper than buying plants, more expensive than seeds, but cheaper than buying plants. However, the nurseries have grown them long enough that it's only a three-year wait before, you're, uh, before you should be harvesting. And they typically will know whether or not they're all male, and then they only sell the male ones, right? They destroy the, the female ones. They also will know a little bit better about you know, what it's, because it's kind of like buying a bare root bush from a nursery, right? It's, it's ready to go. So my recommendation is crowns, and usually at this time of year, can, you can either get them from nurseries, big box stores, you can order them online. Uh, oftentimes they'll come in packs of a dozen crowns. You can buy three at Marks. 
And by three, okay. <laughs> so she says, she says, Marx has them three. Do you know what, how much they were? Do you, do you have any idea? Four bucks or something. Four dollars for the three? Yeah. yeah, that's not bad. So to think about your turn, return on investment for that, you know. I have a question. You said they need male and female, and they said oh, they destroy all mm -hmm. the, ma uh, the female. Well, how are you getting the female then? Well, they destroy, they don't sell them, let me put it that way. Right, so they sell you the males, okay. then they use the, fem the male and female ones to breed themselves. Okay, so, so as, that a, as a just amateur gardener. You only want males. You only want, but well, where are we going to, how are they going to reproduce? Well, so remember, one single plant will live for 20 years. Yes. So you don't really need it to reproduce. Once you have a male, the male just... The male keeps going for 20 years. And, and there will be offspring. Or you just want the male. You just want the male. I, see, I, I got it now. Right, because one plant, if you yeah, remember, remember the picture that I showed you earlier that had a whole bunch of the yeah. spears coming up? That's all from one plant. Okay, I got it now. <coughs> okay, good questions. Okay, so how do you plant asparagus? You've, got, you've gone to Mark's and you've gotten your three crowns, or you've gone to Mark's and gotten your dozen, or, or uh, Lowe's and gotten a dozen crowns, whatever, right? So how do you plant it? So the recommendation is this. You start with a trench. So what you want to do is get that asparagus crown down well below the dirt soil, the, the, the level of the soil. So the way you do that is the, you start with basically a foot deep trench or hole depending upon how you're planting them. So sometimes I'll do, I've done where I want just one asparagus plant here, so I just dig one hole, right? Or if I want a row, like the picture that I showed you earlier, you know, then I, I do a trench, right? But you want a hole that's a foot deep. Inside of that hole or trench, you're gonna put about three inches of compost, well composted materials. What that does is gives your plant, your asparagus plant, a good head start, right? It's feeding the plant. Then you're going to lay that crown or plant. If you bought a plant, you're going to set it right on top of that pile of compost. But if you've bought the crowns, you're going to, you're going to spread those roots out across, you know, basically across the, the top of that compost layer. About, again, 18 inches apart. Then you're going to cover them with three inches of soil. So if you remember, you've dug 12 inches down, you've got three inches of compost, and now you've got three inches of soil. So it's only, it's still, your trench is still six inches deep, right? You're going to water it, and then you're going to wait. You're going to wait until those spears start to come up through that that three inches of soil, right? Depending upon the, the condition, the soil conditions and water conditions and so forth, that can take anywhere from about two to four weeks for them to start to come up. And then you repeat that process. You cover them with three inches of soil, you water them, and you wait, right? So now you've got about eight inches of did I do that math right? Nine inches of, of soil in there. All right? And then you do that one more time. Right? And so, so basically you keep putting your three inches of soil in there until you're back up to the level of the dirt. Right? So, and then you lay mulch on top of that. Okay, so mulch, the recommendation for mulch is something that is organic. So straw, wood, Chop, thank you, chopped leaves. I was trying to think of the third one. Chopped leaves. Don't use hay because hay typically has seed, grass seeds and weed seeds in it. Straw, however, is it's the stems from wheat or barley or you know, things like that. So typically they've stripped all, hopefully they've stripped all the seeds out of that. Straw, both straw and wood chips tend to not break down as quickly as chopped up leaves. Actually, my recommendation is chopped up leaves. But you want to chop them up because if you don't chop them up, then they tend to just mat 
and then the water doesn't get through and so. So you want to mulch it three inches of preferably chopped leaves and then you wait. Right, so they're going to come up. They're going to look the first year. They come up, they're going to look like this. Really small and spindly. They might get two, three inches tall. But you're not going to harvest them because you want the root system to get established, right? So year one. This is a year one plant. Again, it's spindly, small, and a couple feet tall. In year one, you're not going to harvest it. You're going to keep it weeded. This picture is not a good example because there is weeds in that, in that one. You're going to keep it watered. You're going to manage any pest issues, which we'll talk about later. And in the fall, you're going to cut off, cut that, that spear this is called a, a spear, and then when it branches out, it's called a frond. So, so you'll cut your frond down to the ground level and dispose of the, the material, the frond, right? So I recommend that you do that after it dies. So it'll turn brown. So typically, that's going to be September, August, usually after a frost, as it starts to get colder. If you don't clean up every fall, then, and, oh, and I also recommend that you remove those from your, your yard. So either burn them, put them in your, your yard waste, throw them away, don't put them in your compost pile. They will compost, however, any diseases or pests that have wintered over in them or could winter over in them will will be viable the next spring unless you have a really good composting system. So fall cleanup. And again, put down a layer of mulch. Remember they need fertile soil, so they want to be well fed. Compost is is an organic method for for feeding plants. Yes? When you pardon me, when you dug dove the twelve inches, mm -hmm. then you did the three inches of compost put these various down, and then when, is that all in one year? Yes. You build it up? Yes. So when do you know to add the second layer? So you add, so the question was, as you're add, adding that three inches of soil, do, when do you add the second three inches of soil and then the third three inches of soil? You do it as the spears are just starting to come up. So when they're an inch or so tall, then you put the, the next layer of soil in. So that should all be within the first spring, the first year. And, and also the recommendation is because you're doing this when they're, when they are, I um, forgot to say this before, when they are bare root, right, so you're just buying the crown, you should be doing this in the spring. Or if you're doing a plant, you should be doing it kind of mid-summer, right? Good question. So we mulch it, or layer, and actually I recommend at this point more compost in addition to your mulch. Year two, it's basically the same thing. All right, so year two, you're still not gonna harvest. You're going to fertilize and mulch it. You're gonna keep it weeded. Um, once it gets big and you'll see, you'll see how down here, there's a bunch of spears that are all coming out right together. If there's weeds in among that, once they get growing, those are almost impossible to get to. So keep them weeded early in the spring when you can actually see the plants, see the ground, right? But then what I do is I've, before I put down the, the mulch for the, second, for the next year, I put in whatever compost or fertilizer that I would do and then put the mulch on top of that. Again, manage pests and do my fall cleanup. So that's year two. Year three, I finally get to harvest some. However, that depends on the size. Again, if, you, if, you're, if you've done a good job of putting your plant in the right place, getting lots of good fertilizer into it, your soil is well drained, so you've treated it the way you're supposed to. By year three, 
you'll have nice big thick spears, right? So like these are. If you haven't, you'll still get little spindly ones like this. Or maybe you'll get something that's a little bit more in between, right? If you're still seeing those, then you need to do, you need to go back and think about, did I put it in the right place? Did I for feed it? Is it well drained? Because it's you, and as you harvest, you want them. So I don't know how you guys feel about buying asparagus in the grocery store. If you buy ones that are little like this versus big ones like this, what's your opinion? Do you like them little or do you like them big? Why? They cook better, they're more tender, they're tastier. They're tastier. I, I actually look at all of the ones in the grocery store that look spindly like this and think actually they are damaged. Those, those people who are growing those are damaging their plants. They're, they are reducing the amount of years that that asparagus plant will produce. The recommendation is that if your if your spears are less than pencil thin at the bottom, so that's about this one, you should stop harvesting. So if, you're, if, if you got to year three and you don't have them that big, you need to, keep, you need to go feed them, move them, something, right? If the, as, as you harvest in the spring, you only want to harvest until they stop being this way. So what'll happen is the first ones that come up will be nice and big and thick, and as the root systems kind of tend to get, the energy gets used up, they'll get smaller. So when they get thinner, pencil thin, stop harvesting for the year. Okay, so you're only, so the first year, the year three, you're probably only going to harvest a few weeks, a couple of weeks, a few times, right? Year four, five, six after that, if you've done a good job with your asparagus, then you'll be able to harvest longer up until the point in time where those spears start to get smaller. But so year three and on, you do the, basically the same thing. You do get to harvest, but you still need to weed, fertilize, mulch, manage pests, and do your fall cleanup. Right? If, if you do it right, generally say, how long does it usually, can it last if you... So if you've done a good job and you've got healthy plants, your harvest is usually after a year about four is four to, or sorry, six to eight weeks. And you'll be tired of asparagus if you're really, you know, you, but there's great ways to use it. You can freeze it, you can can it, you can pickle it, you know, there's, or you can give it to your neighbors and they'll love you for it. Okay, so we've talked about asparagus in the landscape, what the plants need. We've talked about how to buy it, plant it, and, maintain it. And we've talked a little bit about harvesting, right? So now we're going to go into what are the common pests that you deal with? So when I say pests, I'm talking about both disease and insects, right? So we already talked about the fact that mammals aren't really pests of asparagus, right? So the number one pest of asparagus is the asparagus beetle, hence its name, right? because it loves asparagus. As an adult, it looks like this. There's a couple of different species within it or varieties of species. Some of them have a little bit more stripedness on it. These little beetles are about a quarter of an inch long. They're really not very big. But they love asparagus. Where they really become damaging is in their larva stage which is their little grub stage. Again, this little grub is only about a quarter of an inch long and it's a really unassuming, dull, kind of grayish brown. But they are very hungry little guys. And if you remember what the asparagus, the picture of what the asparagus frond looks like, it's got all these little tiny leaves that almost look like pine needles, but they're only about an inch long. These little guys love to eat those little one inch long leaves. And if you remember what I said, that the asparagus plant has to get the sun, the energy from the sun, put it into its root system in order for it to develop spears the next year. If these little guys eat all those leaves, 
it can't produce its energy and put it back into the to the the um, the roots. And so then next year you won't have nearly as good of a harvest, right? So how do you control these? Well, I'm a big proponent of try the more organic methods first. So this is what the eggs look like. So if you think about typically your, your asparagus is growing vertical, right? But you get these little tiny egg things on the edges of your, of your spears. Um, the, oh, I forgot to tell you that the, the beetle itself doesn't really eat the leaves, it will, but it will gnaw into the, the fronds, the stem a little bit and damage the stem. So it still can do the same thing, it can still damage your plant, but it, it's not quite as hungry as the grubs are. So, eggs. So how do I, how do I deal with them? I hand, first, first line of defense is you can hand pick them. The beetles are really hard to catch, but the grubs don't run very flat, fast, so, so they're easy to catch and kill. Or the eggs, if you see those, you can just take your hands up the, the front and just kind of wipe them off. Right, so that's your first line of defense. Yes? Am I to assume that, that these larvae don't appear until the asparagus it has firmed out then? Mm, correct. Yeah, so, so, the, the so, so the question was when do the, the grubs or the larvae appear? It will be after the, the asparagus has, has leafed out, yes. So after you've let it grow, right, so you're no longer harvesting and it grows into this big plant, that's typically when, when you get them. Good question. Predators, right? So another natural way of dealing with, with pests is predators. The number one predator of asparagus beetle larvae is wasps. So if you have a yard that is friendly to wasps, you will have much less trouble with asparagus beetles, right? So, you know those little wasp nests that appear in the corner of your house? If they're not bothering you, they'll bother the pests that are in your yard, right? So I don't recommend wasp nests in places where they might sting you, but if you can leave them in other places, you're, you're, they will take care of a lot of your pest problems, and especially these. Some more organ organic sprays would include neem oil, and then there are also just your typical pesticides, but when you look at any pesticide, will tell you what are the, the insects that it, it uh, treats for, you need to look. Does it treat for asparagus beetles? Right? Because not everyone will do that. Sorry, I didn't do my homework enough to tell you which ones do because I'm not, an, I'm not gonna advertise for one particular one. So just do your homework and look. Okay, the second most common insect that eats asparagus plants is Japanese beetles. They are not as ferocious or hungry as the asparagus beetles, but they will eat the leaves. And they eat them as adults, not as larvae. The larvae look like this in your ground, in the soil. They actually never come out of the soil. Um, asparagus, or sorry, Japanese beetles are imported from the Orient. They are not native to the, to the, the Americas. And they, their grub stays underground until it, what would be the word? Pupates uh, becomes, <laughs> <laughs> matures, thank you. Matures and becomes a beetle, and then that's when it actually comes up out of the ground. Asper or Japanese beetles are very difficult to control, especially if, if you don't like pesticides. Number one way to avoid Japanese beetles is to not have their favorites. So, I personally prefer to go to, um, I'll just pick some, Myers is my favorite grocery store, right? So as I'm on my way to Myers, I see McDonald's and, and, and I say, oh, maybe I can go to McDonald's for lunch, right? But if my choice is Red Hawk, which is five miles down the road, right, I may not go to Red Hawk because I'm lazy, right? So Japanese beetles are the same way. If you plant roses, grapes, beans, and there's one more that I can't remember. 
blueberries. Those are the plant, so the first three, roses, roses, grapes, and beans are their favorite foods. They will be attracted to them. Just plain and simple. If you have those plants in your yard or your neighbors have plant, those plants in your yard, they're going to attract Japanese beetles. And they're opportunists. Right? So although those are their favorites, that doesn't mean that that's the only thing they eat. Right? So if I have beans planted right next to my asparagus and the beans attract the Japanese beetles, they're likely to get onto the asparagus. Sorry, the fourth one is bear, raspberries, blackberries and, and raspberries. So it's brambles. So Japanese beetles have a ten, they do scouting. They, send, they have scouts, right? So if you can get them early and, and kill off the first ones that appear, then you're much less likely to have trouble with Japanese beetles. But once you have an infestation and you have them in your yard, you're prob that's probably not going to help. So avoid their favorites. Hand pick them. You can, they're actually not that difficult to trap because when you hit the branch that they're on, they drop. And so you can drop them into soapy water and then they can't get out and they drown. And kind of sounds bad, but it's, what, it's the easiest way to trap them. Predators, there's not a lot of predators because they're not native here. Although I have had a group, a flock of starlings come and devour them on occasion. So there are some birds who will, will eat them, but it's minimal. Pesticides, there are some pesticides out there. Primarily, they're focused on killing the grubs. So once you get them, you know, you can kill the grubs off. So you may not have as many next year, but they don't really kill the adults. Okay, so let's talk about, that's pests, that's insects. Those are your two most common insect problems. Then there's diseases. There's four main diseases that will attack asparagus. Rust, blight, crown, and, and spear rot, or this one that I can't pronounce, wilt. All of these, the best way to deal with them is to prevent it, right? So the best way to treat disease is to prevent it. So just like if I eat a healthy diet, I'm less likely to be sick. If we take good care of our asparagus plants, they're less likely to be sick as well. So if remember those things that we said, you plant them in the right place, you don't overcrowd them, they're well-drained soil, they have lots of sunshine, you've fed them with compost or fertilizer, and you've kind of taken care of them. You, you keep the pests, you keep the insects down from, keep, from eating the leaves. And um, so that's your first line of defense. Second line of defense, actually, you start with this, is to buy disease-resistant plants. There are varieties of asparagus that are less likely to be affected by disease than others. Okay, so then the full sun, avoid overcrowding. We already talked about these well-drained soil, water them, keep them fed, and weed and mulch, okay? And then do your fall cleanup because the diseases are what will overwinter in those asparagus plants, right? So remember, remove those, don't compost the, the, the fronds, remove them or burn them, if you're allowed to burn them, depending upon where you live. The final option is fungicides. So there are some fungicides. A fungicide is something, it's kind of like the antibiotics for plants, right? It's the uh, chemicals that will treat diseases, okay? And again, I'm not advertising a particular fungicide, so do your, do your homework and research and see whether or not it will actually treat what you've got. If you are unsure of what, you, what disease you have, Master Gardeners have a helpline that we have people manning this helpline. We have a phone number or you can drop off samples on Tuesday mornings um, and we can help you identify what disease you actually have and therefore you can then go after the fungicide that, that will help you with that particular disease. Okay? All right, so we've talked about all of this. Uh, one other thing that I wanna just kinda cover and that is when you buy asparagus Sorry, I've got water in my, my glass there. And the reason, does anybody know why I've got that in, that, what, got this asparagus in my water cup? Keep it, keep it from drying out. 
keep it from drying out, keep it hydrated. Just like when I put a I cut flour and I put it in water, it stays longer. Guess what? If you store your asparagus in water in the refrigerator, it will stay longer. So the other thing I want to talk to you about, Dan, would you hold that for a minute? When you, when you go to prepare your asparagus, instead of just cutting off the end, what I recommend is you kind of feel for where it wants to naturally break. This is the part that's going to be old and, and not is, is more fibery, more stringy. This part usually is, is okay. So wherever that break is, it might be way up here if you haven't done a good job of storing your asparagus. But you know, see where this one mine was way down here. So I'm only throwing away this little part as opposed to half of the spear. Or I cut off the last half an inch and then I still have a stringy part like right here. So just a little hint on how to use it. Okay, so that is all I have for today for you. So does anyone have any questions that we haven't already covered? Yes? Have you ever tried to grow it in a container? Have I ever tried to grow it in a container? I have not. You can grow it in a container. You need to go through the same steps. And the biggest problem with growing it in a container is watering it, right? So you have to keep it well watered and, um, and, and containers will dry out faster than in ground. But yes, it will grow in, in water. I, have, I had about 20 feet of asparagus, about 10 feet of purple, and 10 feet of, of the greener. And the purple became really thick. I mean, like almost two inches of stock. And it was, what did, what did I, what was wrong that they did that? So was it, was that a bad thing? Yes, it wasn't tasty. I mean, it was actually almost woody. Interesting. So the plant will get, will get woody the, the bigger it gets, right? So as those things start to leaf out, it gets woody. And that's a great question, and I'd have to look that up. And if you want to give me your name and number, I can research that for you. I've and never seen asparagus that thick. Yeah, I, I haven't either. And then the green was terrible, and I know why, because I didn't fertilize it. Yeah. But why would the other? Never, I don't, yeah, I, I don't know the answer. But I can find out for you if you let, if you give me your name and, and contact. Yes. Will diatomaceous earth kill the grubs? Will diatomaceous earth kill the grubs? Well, so the problem with diatomaceous earth, these guys are up on the plants. Diatomaceous earth won't stick to the plants; they're down in the ground. So, because um, I'm, I'm assuming you're talking about the asparagus beetles, will they kill the grubs? I don't think so because diatomaceous earth is on the surface and the grubs are underground, but I don't know that for sure. Does anybody else? Which grubs? The Japanese beetle grubs. I don't think it will. I don't think it will. No. Just because it's not in the right spot, right? They don't need to, to crawl through it. It won't kill them. Okay, so she says it won't kill them because they don't crawl through it. Because, yeah, you would have to crawl through it. Diatomaceous earth works by actually like putting microscopic cuts on the, the insect. And it'd be kind of like you draw, crawl, crawl, crawling through a field of, of glass shards, right? Eventually you bleed to death. That's what happens with, with the grubs. Yes? Are there a lot of varieties of asparagus? Are there a lot of what, I'm sorry? Varieties. varieties. Are there a lot of varieties of asparagus? Um, yes. Uh, the question is, can you find them, right? So. Places like Marks and Lowe's and those kinds of places, you usually only have one. If you want a variety, if you want to, and typically they'll sell the ones that are best selling, which are going to be your disease resistant ones. Um, if you want a real variety, you have to just go out online to some of the online nurseries. But there, there are, yeah. Um, Japanese beetles and milky spore. Milky spore for Japanese beetles will, it kills the grubs. It works on the grubs. Uh, but again, it's, you know, that's next year's crop of Japanese beetles, not this year. So you mentioned if you have a good composter, mm -hmm. if you can't compost the fronts, do you just mean one that gets hot enough? One that gets hot enough, right. So, so composting is a whole other subject. Yeah. Um, but it, in order for it to kill diseases, it needs to get to that 160 degree temperature. 
And so if you don't have a system, I cold compost, so it, it wouldn't kill it in my mind. So if you do a hot compost, that'd be great, but most, most home gardeners do not. Um, the mushroom compost that you can buy, is that a good is mushroom compost a good mulch? <coughs> mushroom compost is an interesting um, thing because the mushrooms have actually eaten most of the nutrients and unless the, my ex I don't know the scientific answer, but my experience with mushroom compost is that it really is not that nutrient dense. Right. Um, so, but you can buy it. Right. Yeah. So. I just wonder if the mushroom always looks so pretty. It looks pretty, <laughs> but yeah, my experience is it is not real nutrient dense. So it, it, I actually, when I did a bed with primarily mushroom compost, I had to amend it with some others. So, yes, ma'am. Um, I've read that they also like sandy soil. Is that something you mix with your soil or not? So if you're doing in, so the question is, do they like sandy soil? Um, yes, because they like well-drained. And would you mix it with the actual soil, the clay soil that we have here? That typically doesn't work as well as you think it will. <laughs> um, but if you're doing a raised bed, you can. You That's can. what I did. I just added some on the top. Yeah, it's mostly the, the sand is beneficial because of its drainage ability, right? It's not a nutrient thing, it's a drainage ability. Yes? Ornamental asparagus? Ornamental asparagus? I've never heard of it. It's uh, in flowers. It's like asparagus fern. There is an asparagus fern, which is not the same plant, actually. It, uh, it kind of le has the same kind of leafiness mm -hmm. but it is not an asparagus it's not actually an asparagus plant but the roots are very similar they they can be but if it says ornamental or if it's asparagus fern it's not an edible plant <laughs> wait hold on back in the back so we, the uh, asparagus beetles found our plant last year and the eggs are there and the black eggs are on there and the spears almost look like a corkscrew willow mm -hmm. form so is that from the egg uh the eggs hatched and then the young larvae pierce the plant or how how, how are the spears getting uh, such bad condition that's a great question but it is the asparagus beetles so so the question was they've got asparagus beetles from last year and the fronds are kind of curly now. Um, it is from the asparagus beetles. I don't, but the question really was, is what actually caused that? I don't know that. I just know that there's a cause and effect. <laughs> I know asparagus beetles will do that. Will will cause them to be curly and not as healthy. So knock off the eggs. Knock off the eggs. Knock, kill the grubs. Let your wasps go crazy. And if that doesn't do it, then go for something more serious. Yes? If you knock the eggs off and they fall to the ground, will they still hatch? No, because they, well, if you knock the eggs off, will they still hatch? They will hatch, but they will not, they need to be on the plant because they won't be able to find the plant. They can't crawl that far. Yeah, the correct. Um, yeah, and you, she's mentioning ornamental. You didn't show a picture of it, but it has red berries. It's very ornamental. So the, so the red berries are, if you've got that female plant, it will create that, those red berries. Oh, so the, females have red berries. the females have little tiny flowers and they produce the red berries. Like Christmas so yeah, they are pretty, I agree. So you're saying that the... Okay, so if you end up getting an asparagus plant that has the red berries, that's female. And the, that, those berries attract asparagus beetles. Oh. So for the next year, you take, you don't want that. And another reason not you to have, another reason not to have female plants. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, what was that? I would. 
Yeah, so the, the comment was dig up the females if you have, for that's a good reason to, another good reason not to have females and to actually destroy them if you have them. Huh. Okay. I noticed if you get crowns that have the two year, three year markings on them. So if you can buy crowns that have two and three year markings on them, that's just how developed they are. The two year crowns, you're less likely to know whether or not they're male and female. So just be aware of that. And you need, and you'll need to wait one more year before you harvest. Is there a question over here? Yeah, the white asparagus that we see, have you ever done that? Do you just bury it as it grows up? I have never done that. Um, but yeah, basically it's white asparagus is you've covered it so it doesn't get any sun. So you can either bury it, you can put a trash can over the top of it, whatever, so that it's not getting sunlight as it grows. But then once you stop harvesting, you take this, the, that off and let it grow and be green all summer long. That's only during that harvest window. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. How often do you actually fertilize? So, so what I do is I mulch it in the, in the fall. I fertilize and mulch again in the spring. So with a 10-10-10 fertilizer, if you're using organic fertilizer, or just a straight, like, uh, one, one to two inches of compost, if you're using compost instead of or, uh, chemical fertilizer. Any other questions? Is manure a good compost? Today? Is manure a good compost? Not unless it has been aged. Right, so aged man manure, yes. So, any other questions? Okay. Thank you guys for coming out and, and enjoy your asparagus.